Africa is home to probably the most beautiful ecosystem in the world. Throughout the vast plains, dense jungles and great lakes, everything from the smallest meerkat to the biggest elephant can seem almost otherworldly to outsiders. Unfortunately, due to brutal wars, corrupt governments and illegal poaching, much of Africa's native wildlife has been at the near constant threat of extinction for the past hundred years. Though much international effort has been taken to prevent this, hunters still pose a massive threat to the survival of many animal species on the continent. But what happens when the hunted becomes the hunter? Well, there was a particular hunter in Africa that was a very serious threat, not because he was destroying rare wildlife, but because of what he was hunting. Us. Gustave. But before we get into the mad lad, no sponsor this time, but a birthday message. A birthday message to someone very special and very close to my heart. So I would like to wish a very happy birthday to Raid Shadow Legend. The hottest game on the Play Store with over 400 characters for you to collect, an epic story mode, fun PvP and character customization is now two years old. And for Raid's anniversary, we have been given questions to answer about Raid. My first one is, where is my favourite place to play the game? And the answer is, in the car, while I'm driving. <laughs> that, that was a joke, P please don't do that. And finally, if I could date any champion, who would it be and why? Well, that would be Elaine. Because she has ma- But my favourite thing still in the game is slapping people around in the PvP arena. And since it's Raid's birthday, for the next six weeks they are running anniversary events and tournaments with some great prizes to win. And they will soon be launching clan vs clan tournaments and they are also releasing a new faction, Shadowkin. So click my link down below to download Raid Shadow Legends and if you are a new player you will get 100,000 silver, 50 gems three ancient shards, and the champion, Jotun, who is really good for new players. These rewards are only available to new players and only for the next 30 days, and you can find these rewards here in your inbox. Gustave was estimated to have hatched around the year 1955. He was a male Nile crocodile, and his home territory stretched from the ends of the Ruzizi River to the northern shorelines of Lake Tanganyika, these were located just next to the city of Bujumbura, which was the capital of Burundi. As Gustav aged, he grew far quicker than the rest of the crocodiles in his habitat. By the time of his first sightings, Gustav was said to have measured at around 6 metres long and weighing an entire tonne. If these measurements were accurate, Gustav would basically have been the largest Nile crocodile ever recorded. Freshwater crocodiles growing to anywhere near this size is said to be extremely rare, meaning that Gustav really stood out to anyone who happened to see him swimming along the lake or just chilling on the riverbanks. In fact, Gustav grew so large that he even intimidated other crocodiles. A ranger of the Ruzizi National Park would later report that Whenever Gustav left the river to explore the nearby lake, a much thinner male called Gutumba would always reappear in his place. But whenever Gustav returned, Gutumba would immediately speed away up the river to avoid fighting with Gustav. As Nile crocodiles age, 
their ability to grow longer and gain more weight doesn't actually slow down. And the average lifespan of a Nile crocodile is about 45 years old. This meant that by the time Gustave turned 50, he pretty much became the permanent uber chad amongst the Ruzizi crocodiles, always getting first dibs on food and mating. However, Gustave's massive size did have one big drawback. Most crocodiles usually hunt smaller, more agile prey, such as fish or antelopes. But because Gustav was so big, he was too slow to catch them. So to satisfy Gustav's hunger, he turned to larger mammals. Things like wildebeests, hippos, and people. From 1987 onwards, government reports from Burundi had attributed literally hundreds of deaths to a single giant crocodile. Upon thorough investigation, many naturalists and researchers were able to conclude that the culprit was Gustav. They were able to determine this through several observations of him that they had made as the years went by. Gustav operated on a very predictable migratory pattern between the Ruzizi River and the northern Tanganyika shoreline, he would ambush beachgoers and fishermen between the months of October and February. Then he would disappear for three years, and then he would be spotted at the lake again soon after. When the park rangers noticed that Gustav was gone, this was also the time that a lot of missing person reports would start flooding in. And the missing person reports only stopped when Gustav returned to his spot at the Ruzizi River. Gustave also had a distinctive marking across his head, which was speculated to be the bruise from a bullet wound. This, combined with his massive size, meant that witnesses could easily identify whether or not Gustave was the culprit of any given attack. Thus, with all of this evidence put together, Gustave was found to be responsible for any major spike in deaths or disappearances caused by crocodile attacks. As a result, people around the capital began to circulate legends surrounding Gustav. Some believed that he was the incarnation of an evil spirit who set out to punish the people of Bujumbura for their wickedness. Others claimed that he was so fast that if he attacked a person and you blinked, you would miss the attack entirely and see only the remains of the person once standing there. Some soldiers also told a tale where a small squad of men encountered Gustav and attempted to kill him. They claimed that Gustav not only deflected the shots fired from their AK-47s, but that he even ate their bullets before pulling one of the men into the river and eating him. To the people of Burundi, Gustav was no longer just some wild animal who ate people. He was a literal demon. And this hype escalated so much that in 1998, it caught the attention of one particular French expat called Patrice Fay. Patrice was born around 1953 and was originally a plumber from the city of Lyon. However, he was an extremely adventurous person so one day he just decided to quit his job and go off exploring. He would travel across the world going through Canada, the US, Central America and then finally finished up in Africa. He arrived in Bujumbura in 1978 and he loved the place so much that he decided to finally settle down there and call the place his home. He initially got a job in construction and eventually married a Rwandan refugee who fled the country due to the genocides that were taking place at the time. Patrice was always full of energy and spent much of his time attempting to make his new home a better place. He would build and open three schools named the Patrice Fay International Schools in his honour. He even built homes for orphans affected by the civil wars and genocides happening in neighbouring countries. However, genocidal attacks were also a problem in Burundi. 
as there was always constant tensions between the nation's two main ethnic groups, the Tutsis and the Hutus. Patrice would attempt to build bridges between the two communities by staging fun plays with actors equally representing each ethnic group. Patrice's selfless actions basically made him a giant pillar of the community and he even became a local celebrity within Burundi itself. He was so loved by the people there that he was voted as the third most popular public personality in 2010. As well as focusing on humanitarian issues, Patrice was also a self-made naturalist and he spent much of his time campaigning for the protection of endangered species. He oversaw the restoration of the Ruzizi National Park as well as the rebuilding of the capital's natural history museum and zoo. He was even the man responsible for giving Gustav his name, which stuck with the local people. He developed a very wide range of expertise relating to much of Burundi's local wildlife, especially focusing on crocodiles. So when he heard of a single giant crocodile feasting on dozens of people in a single day, he knew he had to get involved. He initially took out a hunting licence with the intention of actually killing Gustav as he believed that the safety of the people took an absolute first priority. However, he soon came to understand how resilient Gustav was and realised that Gustav was just acting on instinct. Patrice noticed that when Gustav wasn't hungry, he actually made a conscious effort to avoid humans whenever he saw them. Patrice also had other concerns, which made him want to capture Gustav alive. Between the 40s and 60s, Belgian colonial hunters and native poachers relentlessly hunted Nile crocodiles for their skins and had almost completely decimated the crocodile population in the Ruzizi River. If Gustave could be captured, Patrice saw him as the key to completely restoring the crocodile population by allowing Gustave to breed in captivity. So Gustave would basically get to have never-ending orgies for the rest of his life. The Bujumbura Zoo would start raking in tons of tourist money for possessing a crocodile the size of a bus and the local people would be much safer when fishing and collecting their drinking water. Catching Gustav alive was basically a win-win for everybody. So from this point on, Patrice would attempt to start public campaigns, engage with the media, and meet with potential investors to obtain popular support and funding for his mission. By October 2002, he managed to meet with Burundi's Minister for the Environment, to obtain legal permissions for Gustav's capture. The minister granted Patrice permission, though he only gave him a two-month time limit to do it. The time limit wasn't for some mundane bureaucratic reason, though. The Burundi government was expected to go through some major changes by the end of the year. The incumbent ministers expected that ethnic tensions would flare up very badly as a result of this, and that that was going to result in another civil war. So he wasn't issuing Patrice with a deadline, he was giving him a friendly warning. Undeterred by this, Patrice immediately got to work, enlisting the support of crocodile experts from Tanzania and South Africa. The local people were very eager to help Patrice as well, for obvious reasons. They volunteered to move equipment, build a temporary enclosure for Gustav, and they also transported the science team through the Ruzizi River when searching for him. After days of searching, the team finally managed to track Gustav down along the river, and they discovered that the stories about Gustav's size were actually true. So they began documenting as much as they could about him from a safe distance. And to give you an indication of Gustav's size compared to other crocodiles, here are your average Nile crocodiles. This is Gustav. 
Jesus Christ. They noticed that his body was covered in black markings from possible rifle fire, and he also had a massive lump on his right shoulder blade, which was suspected to have come from a spear wound. But despite this, he was still able to move and hunt like it was nothing, and he also showed no sign of weakness or pain. Basically, he was so big and his hide was so thick that bullets pretty much did nothing. Now that the team knew his location, it was time to try and capture Gustave once and for all. Patrice had commissioned for a massive cage to be built, which he hoped would be big enough and strong enough to hold him. It was measured at a total of 10 metres long, 2 metres wide, and one and a half metres high. The aim was to lure Gustav in with some kind of bait, and once he had fully entered the cage, the trap door would shut. The team would then sedate Gustav and then safely transport him to his new enclosure. So they moved the cage to a river bank where Gustav was active, and then prepared to spring the trap. At first, they tried covering the opposite end of the cage with cow's blood and placed the head of a dead cow in there, for good measure. Though Gustav was always seen swimming near the cage, he never once took the bait. After several days of this, the team were convinced that Gustav would be more willing to enter the cage if there was live bait swimming around in the water. So, they got one of the villagers, (sighs) I'm joking, they got a live chicken and tied it to the end of the cage and waited to see what Gustav would do. This, in fact, did very little, as Gustav didn't even approach the cage over the course of several nights. At this point, the team were getting so desperate that they even enlisted the help of a local witch doctor. They hoped that some local custom would provide some sort of unique insight as to how Gustav could be successfully lured into the cage. I think that if we started, we have to go all the way. Then we'll see. But, well, you know, I'm, you never know in the end. It's difficult to say. Maybe there are things that they know that we don't know. Part of this ritual involved placing the shaman's own dog into the cage as some sort of spiritual offering to the demon who apparently controlled Gustav. Though the shaman did mention that he was getting quite sick of the dog anyway, so it was a convenient way for him to get rid of it. Arsehole. And what must have come as a complete shock to everyone was that Gustav's demon was not compelled by this offering. The dog also managed to escape the cage and get out alive, so thankfully... No real harm was done. But aside from using voodoo, the team tried to vary their methods of capture by setting up snares across the riverbank. Unfortunately, they only managed to capture baby crocodiles who are notorious for having no impulse control. In fact, studies show that baby crocodiles are so dumb that they can literally fall into the same trap up to three times in one day, just as long as there's food in the trap. Finally, the team decided to up the ante and placed an entire live goat in the cage, which hopefully would entice Gustav. Sacrificial goat sounds a lot more traditional than sacrificial dog anyway. However, a massive rainstorm fell upon the trap's location one evening, This ended up shorting out the infrared observation camera and it made the ground under the cage completely collapse. When the team woke up the next morning, they found the cage entirely submerged in the river, rendering it completely useless. The team were unable to build a new cage in time as they were already coming to the end of their deadline at this point. They were ultimately forced to call it quits so that they had enough time to pack up and leave before the shooting started. What perplexed Patrice the most about the huge trap's failure wasn't the fact that it didn't manage to capture Gustave, 
but that it didn't capture any adult crocodiles at all. I know what you're all thinking and what some of you horrible people are probably hoping for. You're hoping that they eventually did manage to get Gustav in the cage and then there was a big Jurassic Park moment where someone gets pulled into the cage, limbs are flying everywhere or something like that, but no, none of that happened. They never managed to catch him at all. Did the rising waters help the monster to escape his hunters? Did the trap fail just as Gustav entered the cage? Whatever the circumstances, the scientists will never know precisely what happened that night. There's maybe a few explanations for the trap's failure. Adult crocodiles can go for months without eating, if absolutely forced to. So maybe Gustav and the other crocodiles just had a bad feeling about the cage and decided to take their chances somewhere else. Also, perhaps Gustav was so used to taking on much bigger prey that the small bait offered to him in the cage just simply didn't interest him. And also because Gustav is the alpha male, the other crocodiles would have probably refused to touch this free food because it was on his turf. I'm not at all an expert in any of this, so this is just me speculating. If there for some reason are any crocodile experts watching this video, then hit me up in the comments and give me a bit of an explanation. Uh, just please make sure that your animal studies degree didn't come from Reddit. Despite this failed attempt, Patrice never gave up on trying to capture Gustav. After the conflict had died down in Burundi by 2004, Patrice, alongside a team from National Geographic, attempted to find Gustav and place a tracking beacon on him. This wouldn't lead to a direct capture in and of itself, but it would serve as an early warning system for people fishing or relaxing near the lake whenever Gustav became active in the area. However, border skirmishes between troops from the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Burundi meant that any serious attempt to travel up the Ruzizi River was next to impossible without getting killed. This would be the last major attempt anyone would make at tracking or capturing Gustav. So where is Gustav now? We don't know actually. Though, people have caught sight of him since 2008 and at infrequent points throughout the years. He was claimed to have been killed in 2019 though there is no photo evidence or detailed descriptions to indicate that this is true. This has just been claimed, and there is absolutely no evidence to support it. I mean, you don't just kill a crocodile the size of a bus and not take a picture, or at least try and transport it home for a trophy, or at least take the skin because it's worth a lot of money. It's like, you just don't do that. So I'm... I'm I'm calling shenanigans. I, I don't believe that he was killed in 2019. Nile crocodiles are able to live until 100 years old. So between that and the fact that he survived literal gunshot wounds from AK-47s, I think we can assume that he's still alive and well. We just have no idea where he is which is pretty terrifying. Patrice always made his best effort to monitor Gustav, but his work was unfortunately interrupted in 2011, after he was accused of being the Burundi Jimmy Savile, and he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. However, French diplomats in Burundi cast huge doubt over the validity of the trial and its conclusions, they noticed that there was often incomplete or inconsistent evidence which was just accepted by the judge and the proceedings of the trial itself were described as being utterly shambolic. I mean, I wouldn't expect a country that's been constantly genociding itself for decades to have a great justice system either. 
The conditions of Patrice's imprisonment were actually so bad that his physical and mental health had almost completely deteriorated. The French diplomats successfully negotiated for Patrice to be extradited back to France. This was because if the Burundi government refused, it would have qualified as an abuse of international human rights. Even though Patrice was thankfully able to return to France and not literally be rotting in a dungeon, it's still sad to see that the country he worked so hard to improve had just stuck a middle finger in his face and told him to beat it on what were most likely completely false charges. At least I, re I really hope they were false charges. It really makes you consider who the real villains are in this story. Was it a giant crocodile that was just acting on instinct and at least avoided humans when he didn't need to hunt? Or was it those very same humans that wage constant race wars against each other and even punish the people who try to help them? Can you tell that I'm banking on uh, Patrice's charges being false? In fact, it might have been humans that allowed the Nile crocodiles to get a taste for human flesh to begin with. The Democratic Republic of the Congo was notorious for throwing piles of dead genocide victims in rivers for the crocodiles to feed on and to get a taste for it. And if the governments in Africa spent more time protecting crocodile hunting grounds instead of waging war against their own people all the time, then maybe those same crocodiles wouldn't be so desperate for food that they try and attack humans. A crocodile expert called Brady Barr, who was actually with Patrice and the National Geographic team in 2004, said, The biggest crocs I've ever seen have been in communist nations or countries at war, places like Cuba, Burma and Cambodia. They have survived because people have other things to worry about. I think it's also because in uh, communist countries and countries at war, there are a lot of bodies getting thrown into rivers for the crocs to eat. That's why they get so big. But I mean, it just goes to show that in communist countries, at least the animals get food. At this point, Gustave would have turned 66 years old, and it seems that the only thing that's going to kill him at this stage is ageing. It would be nice if he could one day be rediscovered and used as a force for good in conservation projects. The last alleged sighting of Gustave was in 2016, when a fisherman claimed that he saw Gustave dragging a massive buffalo into the river. But despite there being no sightings of him since then, people are still going missing. And Gustave's current body count as of recording this video is allegedly around 300. I hope that if this video has communicated only one thing, it's that all animals, regardless of how dangerous they are, are all still beautiful parts of nature and more effort should be taken to protect them and their homes. Maybe not Gustav though. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody says subscribe!